We've got a great topic today. We're going to be talking about Price's Law. Price's Law is an advanced formulation of Latka's Law. Latka's not the guy from the old taxi TV show. No, Price's Law reveals half of all scientific advancements are made by the square root of the total number of scientific technicians. Thus, if there are 100 scientists, just 10 of them will account for 50% of all the academic papers regarding a specific field. Price's Law describes the unequal production of valuable work in domains of creativity and many other areas. It's just the way it is. I learned this relation holds true for almost everything in all endeavors, from stars to biological processes, to business to entertainment, to mountains to wealth. It's called Price's Law, and it originates from research from historians of science and information scientists. They discovered something about university professors and scholars. They discovered there's always a small minority of people who do dominated, they dominated the academic papers within each and every subject. So Price found out the following, now called Price's Law. 50% of the work is done by the square root of the total number of people who participated in that type of work. I've noticed the same ratio in all the businesses that I've been involved in over many years. In sales, when I sold real estate in Hawaii, the number of people who had good success did 50% of the work of the square root of the total number of salespeople. In every workplace, the relationship between value and people is not equal. It's just not the way it is. This is the way it's imprinted. So it seems to be this law is fixed in every area of life. It's fascinating, it's mysterious, and it's powerful. In our country and in our world, only a small amount of people are responsible for the majority of value creation. There's only so many Googles, YouTubes, Facebooks, Twitters, Microsoft, and Googles. That's just the way it is in Amazon. It's just a small amount of those type of companies. So what are some of the implications for us? How can we perhaps overcome it, transcend it, or utilize these truths for our benefit? Only a few writers make up most of the book sales. Stephen King has sold over $350 million worth of books. J.K. Rowling has sold over 400 million books. If you look at the number of music albums per year, a small minority sells most of the music. Only a few bands, singers, and authors, out of millions of each, are responsible for 50% of the sales. How many Beyonce's and Katy Perry's are there out there? Price's Law is almost universal. It's powerful. It's a powerful model. Look at your current profession, or your career, or your hobby. And if you want success in it, real success, ask yourself, are you in a position to create substantial value? Do you have something unique that you can get very, very good at? If not, move on to a di different place where you can create great success. If you want success, become very good at what you do. That's one way you can provide value, but you must be realistic. There's no shortcuts. It takes work and it takes effort. The economist Edward Wolf of New York University found that the top 1% of households in America own 35% of the privately held wealth, and the next 19%, 50% of the wealth. This means 20% of the people owned 85% of the wealth, leaving only 15% for the bottom 80% of the people. And the numbers have grown even more for the extreme wealthy. This seems like an imbalance, seems unfair, unjust. So you see a lot of people labeling the super rich as evil. Some of them could be, but not all of them are. The seemingly fixed physical law is also related to the 80-20 rule, also known as a power law supply. It's found in many natural systems. The simplest version says that 80% of the mountain ranges are clustered in 20% of the land. 80% of the world's internet traffic is clustered in 20% of the websites. 80% of the film industries money comes from 20% of its artists. 80% of the stars in the cosmos is clustered around 20% of the space. 80% of the English language involves just 20% of its words. 80% of the masterpieces of art are produced by 20% of the art. So we see these clusters in large things and in small things. I'll give you an example. I go to a fast food restaurant. I go there to study, to be by myself, so I go on off hours. and. 
I walk by all the empty tables and go all the way to the back. And there I am in the back, studying. And in comes one guy. He orders and he bypasses all the tables that are close to the counter, closer to the soda machine. And he comes and he sits right next to me in the back. Then the next person comes in and sit next to him. That happens over and over again. This is part of that clustering. The clustering is based on power law that reveals extreme events and the wealthiest people are all clustered. These largest websites get most of the hits. Clusters account for most of the impact in a particular area or sphere and everything falls off quickly afterwards. The combined wealth of the top 10 richest people in the world is in order of magnitude greater than the next 10 which is in orders of magnitude greater than the next 10, and so on. That's just the way it works. The rest of the field sits in a long, unimportant tail. This clustering, clustering might sound odd, but the power law supply, this clustering, is in everything. Here's another example. Very, very large earthquakes account for 20% of the earthquakes, but they make 80% of the damage of earthquakes in the world. The impact of one large earthquake is bigger than the sum of millions of smaller ones. Very huge solar flares erupt from the surface of the sun, but those, are, those few are more significant than the millions of other ones that don't. The same applies to numbers in big cities, the size of moon craters, and the occurrence of footnotes on scientific papers. There's no avoiding these type of laws. Once you know the power law supply, that exists, these clusters, they become very, very useful for you. To be successful, do something you're good at, work at getting better at it, and just go for it and do it. And when you do something you're good at, you can provide value. Most people provide more value at a family business than they can at a large corporation because of the 80-20 principle. Social media gives you a chance to do this. I'll give you an example. In November, we started this YouTube channel. And we, we started out and we, we worked our way and we got a hundred views and it was great to get a hundred views, people watching our videos. Then we worked up and we got a hundred subs also, subscriptions. And now we're at the place where we're getting 3,000 to 30,000 views per video and we have 5,000 subscriptions just since November. So we've worked at this thing. We've had no viral videos and yet this past week we reached a million views. So doing something and trying to find a niche and keeping at it and trying to do well at it can get results. This is wonderful. So when you provide more value, you feel better. We know that life is more than just feeling good, but that's a nice benefit. You can earn more and that's great because life is not equal. It's not linear, but you can transcend and rise above it. Only a few people though in every domain are responsible for most of the results, most of the real success. This is an established physical law. Hence, any area of business or whatever particular type of hobby you have that you want to get good at or you want to sell certain things online, make sure it's unique and make sure it's very, very good and you could get the majority of the benefits. So it's Price's Law. It governs the mass of stars, the heights of mountains, human actions, the size of jungles. Price's Law manages the work at uh, corporations and the wealth in a nation. It governs physical reality. Ten people, out of ten people, three will do half the work. A hundred people, ten people will do half the work. Ten thousand people, one hundred people will do half the work. That's just the way it is. So there's two things that can keep you from this. When you see Price's Law, you can be overwhelmed by it. You can get discouraged. So there's two things, fear and discouragement, that can keep you from going forward in your life. Success in your family or your business, your education, or your career, whatever it is, or your hobby. Discouragement comes in and it starts making doubts and growing doubts in your life. You have to overcome those, put those out of your mind, and go forward. Just go for it. Fear will subside. Discouragement will wane when you just go forward in your plan of action and don't overthink it because fear can dominate. A recent study found, research has uh, progressed away from the number one fear being the fear of public speaking. That used to reign as the number one fear for decades and decades. New research has found that the biggest fear that most Americans have now is terrorism. Number two is reptiles. 
Number three, and most Americans are afraid of tornadoes. The fourth is public speaking, so it's still up there. The next is heights. The one after that is needles. Then there's germs. Then there's flying. The ninth most powerful fear is blood. And the tenth fear is ghosts. You can see most of those, or some of those, are not even real. So you don't have to worry about those. So how do we do this? You step out, as we said. You step out and you just go for it. You really, really have to. Find something unique. Find something you're good at that you can produce value that's unique, and then go for it. And then, as you're living your life and going forward, make sure you bless those who curse you. Do good to those who do bad things to you. Okay? Not criminal things. Criminal things, you have to press civil law on them. I'll give you one example. World champion UFC fighter. He got beat up as a kid from this one bully many times. Beat him up quite often. But now this, this guy grows, he becomes larger and stronger, and he, he gets trained in martial arts and becomes a UFC champion. So now he's a UFC champion, and he goes to a stoplight, and there is his bully, the guy that beat him up all the time as a kid. And this guy who was a bully is now homeless, and he's begging for money at the stoplight. So they chatted for a while, and the next thing this guy did was amazing. This guy who used to get beat up by this bully who could have came out and twisted this guy into a pretzel and beat him up because he's now a trained champion. Instead of beating him up and taking revenge, he gave him every dime that he had. Took out all of his money and just gave it to him. Interesting. This champion fighter could have beat him up, could have sought revenge. Instead, he gave every dime that he had. A while later, he gets a knock on his door. He answers the door and there's that ex-bully who was a homeless guy at his door. He goes, I gotta tell you, I wanna thank you so much for giving me that money. It really helped change me. I'm now getting my life back together. I wanna thank you so much. That one guy who could have sought revenge but instead gave impact of this guy's life. If you wanna become part of that 20%, you wanna become part of the elite, be those who could put things behind you, forgive those who do things against you and even do good to them that have done bad things to you. And then, you know what? Don't look at your limitations. Look at your goals. John Milton became totally blind at age 43, but he didn't give up. This guy had trained himself to, to write works of literature by reading the masterpieces in Greek and Latin and the original languages and Hebrew. He immersed himself in that, but then all of a sudden, boom, he becomes blind. You would think his life is over. He's 47 years old. And he finally starts his masterpiece, Paradise Lost, at age 47, and he's blind. It took him 10 years to the end of his life, basically, blind, and he writes his masterpiece, Paradise Lost, as a blind man. Today considered one of the greatest non-dramatic poems in English language. Don't give up. Don't look at your limitations. This guy was blind. And he did it. Next, but not least, serve and serve. I don't want to do that. That's not who I am. Do it anyways. John D. Rockefeller, who was the richest man in the world, he was a strong Christian who gave large donations to his church. But the interesting thing was that when other church members would come in, they would find him cleaning the church and sweeping the floors of the church. Here's the richest man in the world. The richest guy in the world is constantly sweeping and cleaning the church. The richest guy in the world. He'd ring the bell, give his money, teach Sunday school, and do the janitorial work to overcome these things and became one of the 1%. If you want great success, keep it simple, keep it powerful, and don't look at the limitations, but just go for it. This is Mike Robinson. Until next time, say may God bless you. Hey guys. You can really help us if you donate to our worldwide media outreach. Just go to our Patreon page at Mike Robinson Apologetics on Patreon or click the donate button on our main page on YouTube and give as the Lord leads. Thank you so much.